Hello, my name is Jason Davis. I'm a distinguished engineer at Cisco, and I'm in our services department known as CX, or customer experience. And I'm based out of our Research Triangle Park facility near Raleigh, North Carolina in the United States. I also work here at the show to help with the Network Operations Center, or the NOC. And what I wanted to talk about today is the importance of automation and orchestration. And specifically, we're going to talk about Cisco Action Orchestrator, which is a fairly new tool in our portfolio that helps customers automate and orchestrate their workflows. Let's consider what happens in a service deployment workflow. Many times, a customer, and I'll use some fictitious names here just to be fun, requester Reggie, he's going to go into a tool like ServiceNow, and he's going to do some service request management and ask for certain services. And then what happens is, over some time, a prover Allen, maybe a couple hours later, gets involved. And then he looks at the request and says, you know what, this makes sense, or no, it needs to go back for some changes. So a prover Allen does his work, but now another manual step gets involved here and an email gets sent out. Now resourcer Robert is involved and he's looking for a resource management and maybe using a tool like Visionel or something else just to look at resource availability ask if we need to upgrade any links, if there's any more capacity and space and cooling in the data center, and he's responsible for that. And these are all re reflective of good ideas in ITIL and TOGAF kind of certifications and making sure that our processes are well in place. Well, after resourcer Robert does his thing, he sends an email over to implementer Eileen, and now she's responsible for the implementation of the service and the provisioning thereof. Well, she's going to use any number of tools. It could be tools from Cisco like Prime Infrastructure, NSO, DNA Center, or maybe some other tools that are available to her. And then after she's done, she's going to call up Checker Charlie's. And now we're 25, 25 hours into this workflow, manually handing off task to person to person and using different tools. And after Checker Charlie's has done her service assurance check, Maybe she's doing something with a tool like NetRounds, or maybe she's doing something manually with a CLI and running various show commands. Well, now she updates a spreadsheet, because everybody uses spreadsheets, right? And now that's the uh, trigger for documenter Dorothy to know that it's time for her to do some asset tracking, and she updates some CMDB in her availability system. Now after documenter Dorothy has finished doing what she's doing, Maybe she does a chat message, WebEx Teams or something like that, over to Operations Auto. And now Auto is responsible for configuring the network management tools. So now we understand what's being monitored for the services that have been deployed. And Operations Auto might be going into Prime Infrastructure, HP, NNMI, EMC, BMC, any other number of tools that are out there. And then he's aware of what he can monitor. After Auto's done, maybe he makes a phone call to notify our NED, and now NED is doing the service notification internally and possibly externally to customers that are concerned about the services that have been deployed. Well, there's a lot of people involved, there are a lot of tools involved, and there are a lot of manual steps involved here. And unfortunately, a lot of opportunities to make mistakes. And look at the time conceptually here, it took 52 hours to make a change. That's a long time, and we can do better. Well, the next thing we need to do is establish a common vocabulary, because a lot of people talk about automation and orchestration in the same way. I like to say that automation is the use of control systems to reduce human effort using, especially when we're talking about single or repetitive tasks. An example of that might be, I need to register a DNS host name, or I need to ask for the next available IP address. These are single tasks that can be automated. Orchestration, on the other hand, is the use of control systems that direct other diverse systems in the execution of multi-step workflows or processes. So this is where I start to link things together into a workflow, and that's through orchestration. And it may involve different systems. So if you have to ask the question, have you ever needed to do an end-to-end -end workflow or manage things that involve different IT systems and different vendors. If you look at this first graphic on the left-hand side, you might have your service request management system. Could be uh, ServiceNow, 
you could have NSO or prime infrastructure, you might have vCenter, all these tools could be involved in provisioning what's in, in your IT service management environment. What about extracting data and transforming it, normalizing it and sharing it with other tools? This is something that actually happened to me last summer at the Cisco Live event in the NOC. We had uh, events marketing say, hey, let's use um, NSO in the environment and say that we're using Network Service Orchestrator to manage the network. And that's great. NSO is a wonderful tool for configuration management and provisioning, but it doesn't have a dis network discovery component. So I had to look around at what tools we had available in the NOC, and we had prime infrastructure available. So that was a good tool that was running network discovery continuously. So I was able to pull the data from prime infrastructure, transform it into something that NSO could understand, and then push it into that tool through an orchestration process. And then, just to be complete about inventory management, was able to also put that information into an Oracle database acting as a CMDB. So this is another great way to use orchestration. If you've ever had issues of scalability with a tool, this tool only scales to 5,000 devices, or this tool scales to 10,000 or 50,000 or whatever, then orchestration is an important concept for you. I worked with a service provider, had over 150,000 routers in their environment. Now what was interesting about that was the tool they were using only scaled to about 15,000 devices. We ended up with 30 copies of this management tool in order to manage the environment. And that would be very ugly to support. So the way to handle that was going over the top of the APIs of the tool to pull that information into a central area and then be able to search against that central repository or big data lake, if you will, of information about inventory, configuration, et cetera. Um, similar situation might happen with DNA Center. If you have multiple DNA Center appliances, you may need to be able to aggregate that information from multiple appliances so you can have a unified view of inventory. Other situations might be that you have operational or functional gaps in the different commercial tools and you know the information's there, it's just not rendered in a way that you want in the tool. So we can go again over the top of the tool through the API, extract the information we need and then display it or render it in a way that works for us. Now, how do you deal with these multiple tools and data sources? And what you're seeing are quite a few tools that Cisco provides and I'm not showing all of them. We have a huge portfolio. And you're probably thinking, yeah, I've got quite a few of these. Well, it's not just about the Cisco tools. It's also about the partner products. There's a broader ecosystem in IT service management. You might be using Splunk. You might be using ServiceNow along with those Cisco tools. Well, and it's also not just about the partner products. There's open source tools. How many of you are using Git and Ansible? and using open source operating systems and CentOS and OpenStack. Well, now we think about it, that's a lot of islands of information. And if I don't do something about that, I'm going to be doing this swivel chair management a long time. And poor Bob here, after three years of dealing with seven computer screens, is getting a chiropractic neck adjustment pretty quickly because he's swiveling back and forth all the time. That's ugly. But you know what? Help is on the way. Help is coming from Cisco Action Orchestrator. What this tool is, is a cross-domain, technology-agnostic orchestration platform and allows us to do a low to no code graphical environment to build workflows graphically, dragging and dropping activities into a canvas and following a workflow just like we would think about following a process or a flow chart. It's microservices-based, containerized solution using Kubernetes to manage these Docker containers. You can run it on on-prem, you can run it in Amazon, Google, or Azure clouds. And it has a lot of adapters to talk to many different things. Anything that has a REST API, anything that has a CLI is fair game. We're talking prime infrastructure, DNA center, EPNM, NSO, vCenter, Ansible, Oracle databases, an IP-enabled Coke machine if you had one, okay? So I have with me a guest. This is Michael Chenitz. Hey, how you doing? Good. Michael is 
technical marketing engineer. I am. For our uh, cloud automation team. And your group is the team that actually develops this action orchestrator as part of our cloud center suite. So what was your vision of what AO is to be? So, you know, I like to explain it like this. You know, when we go to our childhood, one of the first things we learn to build with is Legos, right? So we take Legos, we stack it up, and we kind of build things together so that, um, you know, we can create what we want using those Legos. You know, and the problem that we saw out there was that, you know, all these companies want to connect things together. They want to glue things together, and they want to be able to create interactions between various things but yet they might not understand how to do it. They might understand how to do it, but it might be a little bit too daunting because they know that it's going to require a lot of code. And what they want to do is have a way to do that that's not intimidating and that people can kind of just come into and they can create these interactions. So the way that we created this was that we created these little objects that you can create and you can kind of just drag them onto a canvas and then allow you to build bigger things out of that. And it's amazing. And the thing is, is that we don't, um, we don't specify what you can and can't build. So you can create your own objects based on REST calls or SSH or whatever it is, create your own little Lego pieces, and then use those Lego pieces. So we just wanted to make it easy and tangible and something that people can uh, you know, use over and over again. And what we're seeing is that people really, really like this idea. Awesome. Yeah, low, low to no code is great. Yeah. Um, I came into Cisco being somewhat of a network programmer. Yep. Right? I was, I, I knew Python, well, it was Perl back then. <laughs> I've learned Python, and so I'm kind of that unicorn, redheaded stepchild kind yep. of a person. I know enough to be conversant about routing and switching, but I always appreciated having tools like this that would allow me to be a programmer, but also to leverage my domain expertise with network management and operations and routing and switching. So the neat thing about this is you could go ahead and you could take a Python script and you can emulate what that would do graphically and probably do it in a lot fewer lines of code and activities. I actually took this challenge upon myself to say, what would it look like if I wrote a Python script that would take some data off of Smartsheet, which is an online spreadsheet as a service kind of offering, and pull it into a database? And it turned out to be like 80 lines of code. But when I tried to replicate that in Action Orchestrator, it was about five activities. And you can see that we support loops and things of that nature. And the neat thing about doing it in Action Orchestrator, I didn't have to worry about missing a tab anywhere, which is you know, kind of the joke for guys that are programmers. That's great. That's great. <laughs> now, the architectural goals, goals for this were to be 100% cloud agnostic. As, as a matter of fact, the first release of this product, we didn't even have a vCenter on-prem installer. You could only install it in Google, Azure, clouds. So they followed up a few weeks later with a vCenter installer, but they are thinking cloud first with this tool. It's also very CICD centric. So when you build workflows, you can actually build them and put them up on a Git repository. And if you want to, you can share them with other coworkers. And, and we share those with customers. As I mentioned, I'm in services, the, the CX division at Cisco. And I've built workflows for customers where we put them into a Git repo. The customer can pull those workflows down with their action orchestrator tool and then incorporate them into their environments. And then all they're doing is linking targets of the workflow into their environment. So when I build a workflow that needs prime infrastructure or DNA center, they just link it to their own IP address, host name, and credentials. The architecture is pretty modular, and we have several adapters that are very useful. Web adapters are great for REST API calls, terminal adapters for talking to anything that has SSH or Telnet capability. It could be a router, a switch, wireless LAN controller, CentOS virtual machine, Raspberry Pi, done it. <laughs> IP-enabled Coke machine again, right? And we're using a lot of common, well-known, and mature open source components underpinning it, like Arango DB and Kafka, Kubernetes. Again, this is a great solution. You can run it on-prem if you need to. You can run it in the cloud. You can run it in both places. I have one very sophisticated customer that does it in both places, and then he has orchestrator talk to orchestrator, and that way he's not eating up WAN bandwidth by sending work requests over his wide area network. So the number of adapters are growing. 
and you can build your own adapters too if you're not happy with the ones that we have. Adapters can be written in Python, they can be written in Go, and just about any other programming language and incorporated with um, JSON schemas into uh, the tool. This is what the tool looks like, uh, where we can go and lay out what our workflows and organize them. We can tag the workflows so they can easily be searched. So some of the ways that we can use this tool are for provisioning. Right? I want to go ahead and configure a device once it's online and drop in my golden config. I can do data collection and analysis. That is how I'm using it here at the Cisco Live Knot to collect statistics about what's going on in the show and to do health checks. Data collection and dashboarding. If you go to the NOC, you'll see the dashboards that I've been building and also data transformation, taking t one information from one tool, pushing it into the other. Operational state checks are great. If you're building something like a router with HSRP, you should be checking to see that HSRP is working. Which router is active at this time and which one is standby? And did they flip? You don't want to wait until you're down to the last uh, router to know that you're, you're down, right? Collection and alerting. We can use this tool to also do operational state checks and then gauge it against different standards or policy thresholds and then send a message out in WebEx Teams or create a dashboard or send an email, a text message. A lot of cool opportunities here. So Michael, what are some, what are some areas that you've seen customers build dashboards and workflows in? Yeah, so it's, it's interesting you asked me this question. So um, it, every time I present to a different customer, they have their own ideas around it. So, you know, it's like you really can't go into a customer and talk about, um, uh, you know, what the target is for this, because as you bring it into customers, and to get back to your question in, in about two seconds here, uh, you know, they have their own ideas about what to do with it. So, you know, a lot of people, uh, depending on who you're talking to, um, have preset things that they were thinking about but didn't know how to implement it. Sure. So for example, if I go into a hospital, a lot of the things that the hospitals are thinking about right now is how do we spin up AI and provide self-service for doctors because these doctors need to spin up these AI, uh, you know, their AI infrastructure very quickly to diagnose various diseases. Sure. So you know, when we go into hospitals, they're thinking about that. If I'm going into someone that does, um, you know, uh, and any kind of um, public utility, maybe they're thinking about all, all, you know, automating some of those public utilities and figuring out how we can automate those types of things. Sure. If I'm going into an enterprise, maybe they're thinking about how do we automate our whole knock, like, like you're, you've done here at Cisco. Excellent. So, you know, depending on where, where you go, they, are, they have their thoughts about doing this, but it's not only about just tech, it could also be business process orchestration. Very true. It can be a lot of different levels, so, and it doesn't have to be just cloud, it doesn't have to be on-prem, it could be a bunch of different things. Excellent. So with that, let's show a few of the examples from the Cisco Live Knock and some of the dashboards that we've meet, made. This is the architecture, what we have. Um, we don't necessarily use Cisco Prime Service Catalog. This is from Cisco Live last summer in uh, San Diego. But you end up having a service catalog or a service request management system that front ends it. And then Action Orchestrator acts as the glue across the different tools, like web servers, WebEx teams. Even Meraki, as a cloud environment, has a cloud API for their dashboard. And then CMX, Prime Infrastructure, Grafana, open source tools, Smartsheet, et cetera. There's just so much here that we can glue together. And I had a situation where I needed to do an availability dashboard and I was thinking, you know, I've got devices that are in prime infrastructure. I've got devices that are in DNA center, and they're different, but sometimes they're overlapping. I've got devices that people want me to monitor that aren't even routers and switches. Like at the registration desk, people want their printers monitored for the badge reader or badge printers and such. So how do we get that into the monitoring? It's not something that shows up in prime infrastructure or DNA center. Well, we build a workflow to say, let's grab that information out of Smartsheet, which is kind of like Google Docs or Office 365 as a shared document. They're responsible for putting it there. My workflow pulls it down and puts it into a database, and then we're able to ping and monitor all this equipment in one workflow, even though it's um, going across several sources of truth. And this is what that shared Smartsheet kind of looks like. 
where somebody can go in and just say, this is the device name, the IP address, the location of the device, and what my name is for contact information. And then after building all this information together, doing the pings, creating the dashboard, this is the result. We can see what devices are down, which ones are slow to respond, which ones were doing great because they're green. Green is good. Red, bad. Red, bad. Always looking for red. Don't want red. Sometimes we see it, red, bad. All right. This is Action Orchestrator. We mentioned it's graphical workflow development and execution environment. So what you're doing is on the left-hand side, you're grabbing your activities from the toolbox, you're dragging them into the canvas in the middle, and on the right-hand side, you're working on the properties of that activity. So that might be dragging something like this web activity in and doing a request to Smartsheet. And I would define on the right-hand side, this is the URL that I need to call to pull down that API information. And where you see that blue hyperlink, that's dynamic data. So I'm not hard coding information into my workflow. I'm able to dynamically pass information into my workflow and pass it into other activities and refer to it forward and backward in my workflow. I can also hit run and go into runtime in this tool and we'll see it go step by step through the workflow. Green activities have been successfully completed. Yellow are what's executing now. And on the right-hand side, the properties panel turns into an ability to show what the output of a command, an API call, or whatever you were dealing with. And that's helpful for troubleshooting and making sure that everything's doing good. And you might need to modify your workflow because the API output might be something that you didn't expect and you need to make a provision for it. So this is really neat. And if you're dealing with loops, you can even go and see, OK, this workflow had 13 loops to it. Let me go see what loop number 11 or iteration number 11 of this workflow was and see what the output there. Some of the dashboards, again, from our Cisco Live knock here. This one's about access point client load. Now, I built this one, even though we have prime infrastructure and we have DNA center, in our NOC, but I wanted to gather the data from those two different sources, aggregate it, and put it into one dashboard so, again, we weren't swivel chairing across the different tools. Prime infrastructure in the Cisco Live NOC is being used for legacy wireless environment, and then the DNA Center is being used for some of the newer Wi-Fi 6 capable devices. Now, the information existed in the APIs of these tools. I would ask each of them through a REST API call, give me all of your access point information. Give me all your radio information. Now give me all of your client information. Once I had that in Action Orchestrator as table information, I can do some analytics on it and find out what is the most heavily loaded access point by client count and what radio is that. And then sort it and then colorize the cell so I can focus my energies on these access points. And the wireless team can take a look at this and say, you know what, maybe we need to play around with some RF or add some more access points in this area to add more capacity. Or maybe they just want to leave it alone. Another one is the wireless client distribution dashboard. You may see this one in the knock if you walk by. And it's been enhanced this year to show Wi-Fi 6 uh, capabilities. And I want to see which different uh, SSIDs are being broadcast by our network and what client counts are on which different protocols in wireless. Now, sometimes information is power, sometimes it's kind of humorous. A few years ago, we had an IPv6 only SSID that we are broadcasting. And using this dashboard, I was able to see that we had one device that was on 802.11g wireless running the IPv6 only SSID connected that way. And I thought, I need to go find this person. I need to give him a $15 USB dongle to bring him into the 2000s for wireless because he is so frugal, he's using 10-year-old radio technology, but so forward-thinking, he's doing only IPv6. So wouldn't have been able to find that before just based on what we had unless we built a dashboard that would show us where the users are. We also wanted to understand what is the adoption of wireless and the different protocols over the years. 
This time we're, we have the same information, but now we're kind of twisting it around. We don't care about the SSIDs anymore. We only care about what the protocols and what the counts of the clients are per uh, protocol. And this gives us an idea about the adoption of wireless over the years. Six years ago when we did 802.11 AC for the first time in uh, Cisco Live London, it was less than 1%. And here we are, you can see close to 90% um, with AC adoption. Now I can tell you a real-time view of this, AC is now backed off to about 85%, and now we're starting to see about 5% with Wi-Fi 6. So this is great. We're going to see this over the year adopt more as Samsung, Apple, and the rest of them include more Wi-Fi 6 capabilities in the phones, tablets, and laptops that you guys all enjoy. Now, sometimes I want to get information and use Action Orchestrator to collect the information, but I don't want to have to create a dashboard. I want to maybe use an open source tool like Grafana and allow it to do the wonderful graphing and dashboarding that their tool was created to do. And what I do then is just use Action Orchestrator, collect the data, put it into an InfluxDB or Prometheus, whatever I'm using, and then let Grafana pull that dashboard up for me. I like to call this one the Jerry Lewis Telethon dashboard. If you're American, it probably resonates with you. But this one shows how many terabytes of traffic we've moved with the internet in the show network. This dashboard is running live in the NOC. If you want to see it, come by, and you'll see how many terabytes. Last time I looked, I think we were somewhere around seven terabytes uh, here in Cisco Live Barcelona. Now, this is Cisco Live, and people want to know how much traffic do we have going on. And especially, there are some IPv6 aficionados out there. I'm looking at you, and they want to know, how much of this traffic is IPv6? Well, created a dashboard to show that. This year, we're actually getting upwards of 25% of our traffic is IPv6. That's great to see the adoption of this new technology. Well, you know what? It's not actually new. It's been around for a while. But it's nice to see that we're finally getting to adopt it. Now, sometimes we want to create dashboards because people may not understand, you know, what is a terabyte, right? So I came up with this fun dashboard that would show a terabyte in the equivalent of pages of text in punch cards because I have some older coworkers that remember punch cards it's before my time. But anyway, uh, we wanted to also say, you know, how many uh, works of uh, Library of Congress, how many uh, digital movies would that be? My kids were asking me last summer, hey, Dad, could you create the dashboard that shows how many Marvel movies this would be? So I said, sure, sit down, do the math to figure out what it would take to encode a two-hour Marvel movie into MP4, and then how long it would take to push that over the internet with the, the internet links that we had, and then created the math to do that. So last summer, Cisco Live, San Diego, we moved about 2,200 copies of all of the Marvel movies had they been in, uh, digitized and encoded. So that was pretty fun, uh, just different information that can be gathered. And then bringing it all together, sometimes we want to gather information about routers and switches and storage and compute and applications and wireless and, and bring it all together into one view as a, an executive view, if you, if you will. Include the collaboration information, too. And that's something we can do with orchestration and our Cisco Action Orchestrator tool. Well, you may wonder, what are the next steps? I saw some pretty cool things here. I'm really interested. Well, your options here are to go to the Cisco Pavilion in the World of Solutions, which is Hall 7, and the Cloud Automation booth. Michael's going to be there along with the rest of the team, and they can talk about what's going on with the tools and help you understand how you can get the tool. Or if you're interested in getting services about the tool and you want some help getting jump started, you can see me at the NOC because I'm in the services department. And the NOC is actually in Hall 6. I made a mistake on the slide. But it's in the center of Hall 6, and that's the NOC booth. And you have a couple links here that will help you get information about the marketing and the technical documentation about Action Orchestrator. I'd really encourage you to look at it. If you want to follow me on Twitter, 
My Twitter handle is SNMP guy. It's also my license plate. So if you're ever in the United States and North Carolina and you see a Chevy Avalanche driving up with SNMP guy, just wave at me. Um, I'd love to hear from you. If you follow me on Twitter, you'll see some of the dashboard updates in real time as we're going. Thank you for your time. Thank you for the Master Series AV Tech crew back there doing a bang up job for us, including the people that did the makeup. All right. This is a wonderful event. Appreciate you guys being here. Have a nice day.